Hello and welcome. On this video, I wanted to take a break from big projects and time consuming and expensive mistakes to look at some easier setup that uh, requires minimum equipment anybody can do at home. So here are four simple yet I think interesting projects everyone can do. Before I jump in, I wanted to take a minute to thank you all for allowing this channel to reach the 20,000 subscribers milestone. This is a big deal indeed, and I'm very grateful for your attention and continued support. So thank you all very much. Number one, from our vantage points, we can estimate the distance to the sun and the moon and get a sense of scale for our immediate astronomical surrounding. All we need are simple tools to measure angles like the shadow of objects on the north-south axis to calculate the Earth diameter. With a simple piece of string, a protractor, and a support of some sort, making sure it is level, I recreated the 2300-year-old Aristotle. Aristotle. Uh, fuck this. How to pronounce uh, this guy? Eratosthenes. Yeah, so his experiment confirming the Earth is in fact round. Using the Sun as a point source, the angle formed by the shadow is measured and compared to estimate the circumference of our planet. This angle difference was measured in October and roughly equate to 1.5 degrees. Using simple geometry, I get a circumference of 40,938 kilometers, which gives the Earth a diameter of uh, 13,030 kilometers, fairly close to the accepted value for the diameter of 12,756 kilometers, pole to pole. Um, with this information, we can wait for a lunar eclipse, and since we know the moon takes about 28 days to complete its orbit, we can time how long it's spent in the shadow of the Earth, and since uh, we just calculated the size of the Earth, its shadow can be used as our standard yardstick. Depending on the path of the moon, this can take anywhere from half an hour to three hours, and that's all we need to calculate the distance to the moon. Using simple geometry again, we arrive at a distance to the moon of... 447,938 kilometers, which is 15% off, but uh, all right, what else? When the moon is at uh, half or first and third quarter, it sits exactly at a 90 degree angle from the Earth-Sun system. So if we can measure the last angle of this right triangle, we will be able to compare relative size of the sun and the moon. When the conditions are right, on a sunny day, I printed a protractor and uh, looked at the angle from the sun's shadow in the general direction of the moon. Of course, this is uh, eyeballing, so I did not expect a very accurate results. Most sophisticated method and instrument exist for this measurement, but uh, that's not the purpose of this video. Anyway, I measured an angle so close to 90 degrees, I could not tell exactly what it was. So I assigned it a one degree default value since that's the maximum resolution achievable here. Using 2000 year old trigonometry, the sun's distance is equal to the tangents of 89 multiplied by 447,000, which is 25 million kilometers. The actual value is six to seven times greater. I calculated the ratio of the size and distance of the moon and the sun since uh, we just calculated distance of the moon. Luckily, the sun and the moon have almost the exact same angular size, about 0.5 degrees from our point of view. So that's all we need to compare the size of the sun and the moon, and we know it to be 57 times bigger than the moon's. So even if not absolutely accurate, using very little instrumentation, basic geometry, and some common sense, we can get a sense of the size and distance of the brightest celestial object surrounding us. Pretty cool, right? Number two, the sound card on the PC is an amazing entry door to many low level signal beyond sound recording. We can certainly take advantage of it for other applications. One such application is the VLF signal detection. Very low frequency signals are very long wavelength radio waves in 100 meters to 10 kilometer range. Whenever an electric field changes its acceleration, some energy is dissipated in the form of electromagnetic waves. Without going too deep in details, lightning certainly fits this description and all kinds of radio signals are transmitted. The ionosphere of the Earth can reflect some of these waves back to the Earth, where they bounce back and forth for very long distances. You can make such an antenna using ridiculously long wire, but uh, the ferrite core type antenna or a loop antenna are easier to handle. 
I wanted to make one myself, but uh, there is a seller on eBay who makes them better than I ever could. And for $40, I think it's worth buying. All you have to do next is plug it into your microphone port, download one of the countless free software available like SDR Sharp, Gold Waves, Spectrosizer, etc. to make it work. I use Spectrum Lad, but it can sometimes be a bit sluggish. Anyway, because of the uh, low frequency, a lot of man-made source can drown the signal. So it's best to get somewhere, at least a few hundred meters from power lines. If not, you'll hear this constant 60 hertz hum. At the time of my little test here, there was some storm in Indiana and Missouri. I think you can hear some of it here. I think those storms are too close and the signal is too strong, but in some cases the VLF signal can travel along the magnetic field of the Earth from the opposite side of the magnetic lines. I am in uh, Michigan and I could have uh, picked up these storms over Argentina and Brazil here. This whistle happened because the shorter wavelengths travel faster in the magnetic field than the longer ones, so they arrive at a different time. There's many other man-made and natural signals you can pick up. I just wanted to share this uh, very basic test. Number three. About a year ago, I started a science channel for kids, but quickly realized some of the stuff I do here might be incompatible with a YouTube policy for younger audience. I did, however, made this uh, pilot video, and I think it fits perfectly in this list. You may have heard the name Willem Herschel. Working with his sister Caroline, they discovered the planet Uranus in 1781. But he's also credited for the discovery of the infrared. The light we see with our eyes is really a combination of all the colors of the rainbow. What we see every day is only the results of the different colors combined together. Sometimes different surfaces decompose light and uh, we can glimpse at what it is made of. This is important because each color carries different information about what we are looking at. Which one of these colors carry the temperature information? That's the kind of question Herschel was thinking about early in the year 1800. To answer that, he used a prism like this one. This is really just a triangular shaped piece of glass that can uh, produce a rainbow. And we call that rainbow a spectrum. Anyway, he placed thermometer on different color of the spectrum and waited to see if there was any difference. Eventually, he noticed the area beyond the color red to be significantly warmer than the other colors. He called this radiation calorific rays, but uh, we call it infrared today. We can recreate Herschel experiment using modern day tools like uh, this digital thermometer. I used this simple glass prism on a sunny day and placed it on my window. The eye can see all the colors of the rainbow we are familiar with. When I placed my thermometer on the red part of the spectrum, the temperature jump and goes back to room temperature when I moved it to other colors. So there, we just verify Herschel theory. We can even go a step further. You see, this is a thermal camera and it can detect the infrared that our eyes can't see. Here, I use it to see what part of the spectrum the infrared are coming from and compared it with what we see with our eyes. Nothing happened really until we get to the red side as expected. Pretty cool, right? With infrared, we can see anything warmer than its surrounding, like these rabbits running in the field or the air disturbed by the flame of a lighter, for example. Number four, we can play with the sound card again, and uh, this time using a speaker and some magnets, I made this uh, low-grade seismometer. These old speakers I had laying around have a small copper coil we can use as a pickup for the small magnetic changes. I use a one meter long steel rod firmly hammered in the ground and just put three strong magnets at the end of it. I like to use the free radio sky chart recorder, but Audacity is also a popular one and there are many audio freeware available again. Once everything is steady, I drop the hammer to test the response and signal amplitude. Gently tapping my foot on the floor produces a good signal too. Because this setup is sensitive in every direction, it ends up being sensitive in no particular direction. A real professional seismometer has only one direction of motion which allows for directional detection. I strongly encourage the interested viewer to check out this uh, homemade one, link in the description. After leaving this setup for 24 hours, I checked the USGS website for possible earthquakes worldwide. I think most of these uh, spikes are traffic on my streets and not a quake in Oregon. After all, this is just a quick project for demonstration or a school science fair or a dropped hammer detector. There's of course plenty of room for design, improvement and method development. So I hope you enjoyed these four simple projects. Constructive criticism is always welcome.
Oh, one last quick note. The continuous decrease of available real estate is beginning to severely challenge my ability to even start many new projects. So I am searching for a larger lab and house away from city drama. Because this can take some time, I might not upload any video for a few months. Rest assured, I'll come back with more projects. I am just taking a break to concentrate on the potential move. Thank you again for your patience and understanding. Damn it!